but there is a culture of self-help yep. in in Borsley. and I think I think that's that's quite important. And that there have been surveys done, um, which have put some kind of statistical form on this in terms of what's usually described as social cohesion. Um, that although Balsall Heath is very racially and culturally diverse, there's a lot, but well, it has all of the usual um, uh, negative factors of deprivation. Despite those, there is a high degree of social cohesion and a sense of, of community. And I, th- and I think that, that was, uh, well, I think that was the reason in the first place why Balsall Heath was one of the first 17 areas in England that were identified to begin with as pilot studies to do the neighbourhood plan because of that record which, which those in government knew about. Um, it's at its worst, or its most problematic, in those bylaw streets of terraced houses that were built uh, mostly pre-First World War, which a few decades ago the City Council was intent on clearing away because they were regarded as substandard housing. Uh, now that that housing is now highly valued, um, very respectable. The the, 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 the the value, the prices are going up very very quickly indeed. And one of the downsides of that is that with the relative affluence that people have, there isn't enough space in the street to park all those cars. Um, Having said that, I think there is in Borsal Heath an excess of car culture, which it was one of the objectives of of the neighbourhood plan to see if we could find alternatives to. I remember in some meetings, uh, more than one meeting, dealing with residents who said, um, my my family's got five cars and it doesn't have anywhere to park them. You know, what, what can the neighbourhood plan do about it? Well, I don't see it's an objective of a local plan to encourage a household to own five cars. Yeah. Um, it's just unsustainable in, in every respect. Um, and the, the kind of policies that we developed in the neighbourhood plan to deal with that were about emphasising the alternatives. So not to be, uh, not to think you could apply any kind of uh, legislation to prevent people using cars, just to make the alternatives better. The railway station is one example of that. Um, getting more off-street parking around the shopping centres. Not easy to find the land to do it, but we've tried to do that. Um, to, I mean, this is a bit of a long-term policy, but a policy to make our residential streets more attractive for walking and cycling, mm-hmm. to encourage people to use those modes rather than hop in the car, to drive the kids to school in the morning and, and so on. So yeah, that, that yeah, the, the parking and congestion and traffic domination is certainly certainly one of the themes. I think when we finally came to the referendum, uh, the, the very last step in the whole process, I and others were rather concerned that a lot of the people who had been actively involved in the process earlier might simply have forgotten what, what we were doing because we we submitted our plan to the council in July 2014 and then it didn't come to referendum until October 2015. So there was nearly a year and a half in which to all intents and purposes, nothing was happening. Um, so, and I think the forum did a very good job in kind of reminding people of what it was all about and getting people out to vote. So that that was one downside. That 
uh, you forget about. You forget what's what's going on. Mm. Um, the other, I think, is is economic. That I mean, one of my complaints all the way through has been that the neighbourhood planning process is not sufficiently well funded. Um, we had to fight the city council right at the beginning to get them to hand over the money, or some of the money which they had been given by DCLG. Uh, they gave half of it to the forum in the end. Initially they were going to give none. Um, but that money didn't last very long and before too long, essentially I was working as an unpaid consultant and that's not entirely unique in my experience, I've done quite a lot of that, but it does, it does create a certain degree of uh, inefficiency I think. Yeah, it is. I mean, from, from talking talking to other neighbourhood planners during the process, uh, I realised pretty quickly that we are very unusual in that respect, that the great majority of neighbourhood plans have been produced by um, communities in rural areas or small towns um, that have at least a significant degree of affluent professional or ex-professional residents who've devoted a lot of their voluntary time to the process and that's that I think is how the government perceived uh, how it should be done the, what, what did Cameron call it the big big society was that was that right yeah. <laughs> the issues that we uh, took on board in what we call the shopping list, which essentially is the, the things that people told us they wanted tackled in the in the plan. Firstly, as I say, we had to edit out of that shopping list all the things that we couldn't take on board because uh, the neighbourhood plan is very constrained in that it can only uh, take on board things that could be delivered through the planning process. Mm. Um, so a lot of very important issues that people wanted taken on were not were not in within that remit. Uh, so we had to edit edit those out. But those that were included, as you say, went across across a pretty broad spectrum. Um, it's worth pointing out, I think, at the same time in the opposite direction to that, that for many of the neighbourhood plans in small towns and rural areas, the big issue for them, in many of them, has been identifying land for new housing. Because the secret agenda or the not so secret agenda of the government behind neighbourhood planning is that it has to be pro-development. A neighbourhood plan cannot say, no, we don't want any new houses built, thank you. That, that's not allowed, uh, fairly or not. So a lot, of, a lot of local plans were struggling for a long time as to which, bit, which green fields in their neighbourhood plan area should be designated to have houses built on them. Now in Balsalee, that's not an issue. Um, for a start, we don't have much developable land. We're, we're pretty built up. Secondly, people in Balsall Heath generally want to see new housing built. Um, different kinds of housing for which are underrepresented at the moment. Housing for the elderly, housing for starter couples, housing for big uh, multi-generational families, th those kind of things. So, to be fair, we never, we, we were never uh, in difficulty of, of experiencing that problem that many other neighbourhood plans have had. So certainly not at the beginning, no, and why should they? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a new idea. Um, I think as we went on, yes, I, I think there was a better, a better understanding. Having said that, I'm sure there are lots and lots of people in Balsall Heath <clears throat> that we never reached. 
you know we, we talk about it being a community-based plan and we certainly spoke to hundreds if not thousands of people but even those thousands are a small proportion of the total population of the plan area um, so you know I wouldn't want to exaggerate the uh, kind of community legitimacy of it we, we, we did we did as well as we could um, and that pre-existing infrastructure that, that you mentioned was, was, was key to doing as well as we did. I, I for one was worried pre-referendum as to how many people were going to turn out mm. um, and I was pleasantly surprised by the, the figure that did. It's not enormous but it was better than I feared might be the case. Yeah.